Another year has passed and a ton of games have released, some better than others, and it's that time of year again to arbitrarily rank which ones were the best. Just like last year's video, remember, this list is subjective and of my own opinions and experiences. Think of it as more of a my favorite games list of this year rather than some objective list of which game was better than the other. Alright, let's get right into it. Halo has a very special place in my heart. The memories I have with this franchise are some of my fondest, which is why the disappointment of Halo 5 Guardians hit so hard for me. I had thought Halo was going the way of other franchises that I had loved for years and that it would never feel the same again. But with the reveal of Halo Infinite in 2020, I and the entire fan base had a small glimmer of hope that maybe Halo would be Halo again. Which is why I'm happy to report that Halo is in fact back, and it's the best it's been in over a decade. Halo Infinite has a lot of flaws, some more interesting than others, but for every misstep or stumble, there's a height Halo hasn't soared to since 2007. While the open world genre has exhausted me in recent years, somehow Halo works in this formula despite everything in my gut telling me it shouldn't, mostly because Halo Infinite's combat is second to none. The sandbox is the best 343 has put together thus far, with a huge arsenal of weapons to wield, all that serve a purpose and are enjoyable to use. The banished are fun to fight with varying AI behaviors making each encounter different, but the star of the show is undoubtedly the grapple shot which, just like Breath of the Wild's climbing and Spider-Man's web swinging, has broken open world traversal for me in other games. On the multiplayer front, Halo Infinite also succeeds. Going free to play has its downsides, the battle pass and lack of content being one of them, but Infinite's multiplayer is so damn good, I just don't care. The near perfect marriage of classic and modern design and gameplay felt both nostalgic and exciting at the same time. It brought me back to Slayer matches in Halo 2 where there was no battle passes or microtransactions or skins or anything like that, just good old-fashioned skill-based multiplayer deathmatches. While Infinite lays it on hard with the back-to-the-roots approach using familiar art styles, enemies, music, scenery, story elements, weapons, etc, etc, it also lays the groundwork for a much more exciting franchise in years to come. Infinite is a base to grow upon, and it's incredibly solid if a bit rough around the edges. Microsoft deserves some brownie points for actually delaying Infinite and allowing 343 to polish it to become one of the best Halo games in recent memory. James Gunn's 2014 MCU film is one of my favorites of all the cinematic universe, so when I heard a Guardians of the Galaxy game was revealed at E3, I was pretty excited, but my excitement quickly turned into disappointment when I saw who was publishing said game. With last year's Avengers game being a live service, looter brawler, loot box, microtransaction, buzzword disaster, I had no faith that Guardians wouldn't fall victim to the same shenanigans. So much so, I completely ignore all press, trailers, and gameplay as to not get my hopes up. But to my and virtually everyone else's surprise, Guardians of the Galaxy was actually fantastic. As a linear, story, and character-driven experience, Guardians is a breath of fresh air in the current oversaturated open-world market. Choosing to solely control and focus on Peter Quill, aka Star-Lord, pays off both in the narrative as well as combat as the other Guardians act in supporting roles, commanding them to pull off a number of abilities as you fly around arenas lighting up enemies with your blasters. Narratively, Guardians is great, taking the base versions of Drax, Groot, Gamora, Rocket, and Star-Lord you know from the MCU films, and building upon them with details from the comics, making them much more well-rounded and interesting characters throughout the game. Tie everything together with a surprisingly emotional story, some of the best environmental and enemy designs in the business, top-notch writing, voice acting, and a soundtrack that kicks too much ass, you've got one of the best games this year hands down. It proves me wrong for ever doubting Eidos Montreal. When The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword originally came out in 2011, I was far beyond my Nintendo years as a teenager, but I still had a soft spot for the Zelda franchise. On launch day, I went out, bought a used Wii with a copy of the game, which I still own by the way, and prepared for an entire weekend of Zelda-y goodness. What I got was a janky, motion-controlled, hand-holding experience I forced myself to complete because I felt obligated to the franchise I held so near and dear to me. From that day, I never touched it again until Nintendo remastered it for the Switch. Skyward Sword HD is the perfect example of why HD remasters are a positive in today's industry. Take a game that was marred by subpar controls and direction and fine-tune it to the point where it's almost an entirely different experience. Fi went from an annoying obstacle to a character I genuinely like, the flick controls work way better than you expect, and elevate the combat to an actually enjoyable part of the game. The watercolor-like graphics shine beautifully in their new HD coat of paint, the dungeons might be some of the best in the whole series, even rivaling Twilight Princess for their inventiveness and their use of the unique items found throughout the game, 
The soundtrack is still fantastic, and the great story and characters that existed in the original are now front and center. Fixing Skyward Sword's major faults from the original helps the entire game shine so much more brightly than it did 10 years ago. Don't get me wrong, Skyward Sword isn't a perfect game, and there's still many issues from the base game no HD remaster could fix, but the amount of frustration and disappointment I had from the original was equaled by my surprise and enjoyment for 3 Master. So much so, I'd rank Skyward Sword HD my personal top 5 Zelda games at the moment. It's that good. No one in their right mind at the start of 2021 would tell you that Nintendo was going to announce and then release a new 2D Metroid game, and it would be one of the best games of the year, but here we are. Metroid Dread does so many things right that it's hard to understand why it took so long for it to come out in the first place. Dread builds off of the strides taken in Mercury Steam's Metroid 2 remake for the 3DS, while creating an all-new adventure for Samus. Metroid Dread is an instant classic of the genre the original created. While the level design is fantastic, the suit upgrades empowering, and the exploration rewarding, the aspect of Metroid Dread that captured my attention was its speed. Sprinting through ZDR, sliding into tight spaces, the quick and snappy combat, and the flashy counter system makes the main gameplay so much more fun and enthralling than previous titles. This makes exploration more fun, the boss battles more invigorating, and the overall experience that much more enjoyable. It's going to be hard to go back to games like Super Metroid afterwards. Dread's able to marry the series' best gameplay and design with more modern cinematic storytelling, resulting in a game that feels both nostalgically classic and fresh all at the same time, which is quite an achievement. My only gripe is its subtitle, as the new Emmy enemies don't evoke much Dread. They are a formidable foe, there's no doubt about that, and there's plenty of frantic moments to be had sprinting away from these soulless robots, but not enough to create an oppressive atmosphere that's worthy of its subtitle. But if my biggest nitpick is his name, you know Dread delivers the Metroidvania experience fans have been clamoring for since Fusion. One thing's for certain, it's great to have Samus back in action again. I'll give it to Capcom. When a new Resident Evil game comes out, it's almost a guarantee you're in for a totally new experience within the franchise. When Resident Evil 7 launched in 2017, the series shifted back to its roots, but changed to a first-person perspective, and was an instant survival horror classic. And after the impeccable Resi 2 remake, Capcom had massive shoes to fill with the next installment in the franchise. Village is such an oddity. Never have I come across a game so fragmented in its gameplay, tone, and design that works as well as Village does. The combat is improved from 7 with way more weapons, adds a much-needed upgrade system, as well as a revised inventory system similar to Resident Evil 4's. One moment you're exploring the titular village in classic non-linear resi fashion, the next you're running away from an 8-foot tall vampire mistress a la Papa Baker in Resident Evil 7. Village is almost a love letter to every fan of the franchise, from those who love the classics with their puzzles and exploration, to those who loved 4 through 6 with its bombastic action and over-the-top stories. Village is able to marry all of these varying gameplay elements near perfectly, offering a varied experience that grips you and doesn't let you go into the very sad end. Resident Evil Village was a fantastic experience from front to back, and had me yearning for more long after the credits rolled, and it's the best game I've played in 2021.